Hey everybody, it's Charles from HumbleMechanic.com and today I'm going to teach you how to time a VR6 engine. Doing something like a timing belt or a timing chain job can be pretty intimidating, but it's usually not that terribly hard, and this engine is pretty easy to time. First, we're going to start by finding TDC cylinder 1. That means we need to find the highest point the piston comes up for our cylinder 1 piston. There's a couple of ways we can do this. One, we can use a piston. The correct method to do this is to use a dial indicator down through the spark plug well and rest it on the piston, and as we rotate the crankshaft around, the dial indicator will show us the truest point of TDC on the piston. You can also use something in, like an indicator like I used to find the approximate top dead center of this cylinder one piston. On this particular engine, you need to be careful because the angle of the spark plug hole, you aren't going to have it perpendicular to the deck of the block, so the indicator can slip on you pretty easily. Lucky for us, we don't have to do it that way because we can use the marks provided on the engine. On the front side of the engine, there is a mark on the balancer as well as a mark on the crankshaft flange. You can see this tiny mark here on the flange. I like to add a little yellow paint to make it even easier to see. Use whatever color you prefer. That mark will line up with a tiny V on the inside of the pulley or the dampener. Not only do I like to put a mark on that tiny little V, I like to put a mark on the outside of the dampener as well. That way I can see the position of TDC no matter where I'm looking at the pulley. On the back side of the engine, there's a half ground down notch on the crankshaft gear. That ground down notch will line up with the split of the main bearing. There's also a mark on the flywheel itself that we can use, but the corresponding mark is on the transmission, so you really would need to have the transmission installed. Also, aftermarket flywheels might not have that marking. Something you do want to keep in mind with the crankshaft pulley, because there is a rubber core to that, that pulley can actually rotate just a little bit. It's not a very common thing, but the outside of the pulley can actually be clocked differently from the inside of the pulley. It's not very common, just a minor word of caution. Once you have found TDC for cylinder one, we actually need to rotate the crankshaft backwards about an eighth of a turn. This is going to keep it off of top dead center so that when we install our cams, we don't run the risk of bending any valves or creating any valve to piston contact. This is one of the only times where you want to rotate an engine backwards. You don't even really need to go an eighth of a turn on this one, just enough so that it's not at TDC anymore. Next up, it's time to install and time the cams. Again, be sure that your piston is not at top dead center. This will allow us to install the cams in any position that we want to. I like to set the cams down in their position and find the place where there's the least amount of resistance. Of course, we want to lubricate our camshafts, lubricate our cam cap bearings, and set the caps on top of the cams. I also like to slowly tighten down the cam caps in stages before I torque them down. You'll find that most repair manuals recommend doing it this way. Even when we come to torquing the cam caps down to 20 newton meters, I like to do this in stages as well. You don't have to do it that way, that's just the way I prefer to reduce the amount of stress in one area of the camshaft. We're gonna rotate our camshafts using a 24 millimeter wrench and find the place where the plate fits. On the back side of each of these cams is a notch cut in it for this special tool plate to go in. The plate will only fit with the cams at their correct position. You should not have to force this plate on, it should slip right in. And I like to throw one bolt in it just to hold it in place. Now that we have our cams locked into place, we can go ahead and install the gears. The back cam or the cam on the right side as we're looking at it is the one with the cam position sensor wheel and there's a sensor that goes into the cover to read it. The cams are keyed so the gears will only fit on one way. I like to only put these bolts in hand tight because I come back at the end and do all of the torquing all at one time. Next, we're going to install the intermediate shaft. This intermediate shaft drives the oil pump. It also holds the gear for the lower chain as well as the gear for the upper chain. So uh, she's pretty important. Go ahead and lube your bearing. Go ahead and lube your gear. And go ahead and lube the end shaft that goes into the block. I like to install the bolt on the end of this gear because it makes it a little bit easier to hold while installing it. There should not be any resistance to this gear at all. It should slide right in. If you still have the oil pump drive gear, you may need to rotate it a little bit to install it. And once it's in, go ahead and give it a spin and make sure you don't have any issues. Next, we're gonna install the cover for the intermediate gear. It only goes on one way. 
be sure to replace these Phillips head screws. They're super soft, so you probably tore them out coming apart with it anyway, and these should be Loctited. You are not seeing me Loctite it here, but I actually did go back and Loctite those bolts. If it's not already installed at this point, go ahead and drop in the oil pump drive gear. We're not gonna bolt that down because we're gonna use that to prime the oil pump. Next, it's time to put on some chains. We're gonna start with the lower chain. If you'll notice on the cover for the intermediate gear, there is a notch right at 12 o'clock. I like to paint that in order to make it easier to see. You'll also notice on the shaft, there's a flat spot. We want that flat spot at the top. That flat spot at the top will now line up with a flat spot on the gear for the lower chain. Before we put this lower chain on, we do need to bring our crankshaft back to TDC and make sure our shaved down tooth as well as our marks in the front all line up. In addition to having that flat spot on the gear, we'll also notice what would be at 12 o'clock here a mark on the gear. That mark will line up with the cover for the intermediate shaft. At this point, it does not matter where our chains are gonna be at. We do wanna make sure that we install our guide rail first, a mistake that I did make. Next, we're gonna install the chain on the teeth of the crankshaft and bring our gear up to the intermediate shaft. At this point, it doesn't really matter where the intermediate shaft is, but as we get the chain on and the gear set onto the intermediate shaft, we wanna rotate that gear on the intermediate shaft. We wanna make sure that all that tension is on the tensioner side. If we put this together with the slack on the non-tensioner side, we can actually create a situation where our engine is not properly timed or the tension on our chain will not be correct. It's really important to make sure the slack in the chain is all on this lower right-hand side. And of course, I like to mark all these gears as well to make it easier to see and to do a quick check. Don't forget to put your tensioner on and I like to Loctite these bolts when I put them in. Our lower chain is all installed and properly timed. Let's move to the upper chain. Our camshafts are already timed, our gears are non-adjustable, so we really just have to drop the guides in and put the chain on. I like to use Loctite when installing these guides as well. It's easier to install the chain on the cam gears first, so you don't have to fight it around the gear, but it can be done either way. Let's start by putting the tensioning guide on. Once that's installed, we'll put the pin for the front guide in. Then we'll drop that front guide from the top down, rest it on the pin. Go ahead and put the bolts in for the front guide using Loctite on all of those bolts. Now you can have some movement in the camshafts even though they're locked and that's okay. That's actually gonna help us get the chain on. If you'll notice right here, even though the chain is on and the cams are set, this is not correct. Any slack in between these two cams right here will get taken up when we rotate the engine around and will actually probably end up with an engine out of time. So you do want that chain pretty tight between the two cam gears. If you need to take slack out or rotate them a little, grab that 24 millimeter wrench and go ahead and move the cams so that you get the slack on the tensioner side, just like we did on the bottom chain. Now that that's set and correct, it's time to time the upper chain to the lower chain. This gear is also keyed to the gear that's already installed on the intermediate shaft. So as long as our first gear is timed properly, we don't have to really worry about timing it. We set the gear in the chain, find that notch, that keyway, and then go ahead and install the gear. You might need to move the camshafts a little bit. That's okay, just as long as when you get that gear on, the slack is on the tensioner side. You may need to tap that little gear into place. What you don't wanna do is use the bolt to run the gears together. If you don't get them square, that can cause problems and damage to the gears. Once that's installed and the bolt is snug, now our engine is officially timed. Before doing anything else, I like to do a quick quality check, make sure my cam plate is still installed, make sure that all of my marks all of the marks that I made and the factory timing marks still line up and making sure that the slack in the chain is all on the tensioner side. You'll also notice that I added several more yellow marks. This is for three reasons. One, very quick visibility so I can be 100% sure that I have everything timed. Two, for rechecking our timing when we go back, these marks will help us identify very quickly that we're in time. And three, for future video use. I'll be working on a different timing video where we'll be using these marks a little bit differently. Next, it's time to torque all of our bolts, whether you wanna go from top to bottom, bottom to top. Make sure that you put a torque wrench on every one of these bolts. I like to also add a white paint mark, different from the color of our timing mark, to be sure that I got all the bolts. In fact, doing this allowed me to find that I missed one the first go around, so I was able to go back and retorque it. Once everything is installed, it's time to check and make sure that we got our timing right. 
The key on this engine is we have to hold tension on this upper chain. If we just rotate this around, your timing will jump. This has happened to me, it will jump. So we have a couple of options. We can put the upper timing cover on so that it holds the guide rail in place and takes up the slack in the chain. Or we can hold the rail, effectively simulating having the tensioner installed. I went ahead and just put the cover on. It's really easy, two bolts. It doesn't have to be sealed or anything. You just need it on there to hold that tensioner in place. Next, we wanna go over to our crankshaft and rotate that around. I like to do four total rotations of the crankshaft. Most repair manuals will say two, but four makes me feel a little bit better. That is two complete cycles of the engine. The key here too is to make sure you're rotating this around clockwise or righty tighty because that's the way the engine rotates when it's running. Because we have our marks on the front side, as we come around on that fourth turn, we can stop it right there and make that sure that lines up. And next, we're gonna go back in and recheck everything. We'll put our cam plate back in and make sure it fits. Let's start at the bottom. Our crank tooth lines up properly. Our marks on the gear to the plate in the intermediate gear line up properly and our cam plate fits so we know our camshafts are good. I also made these yellow marks for the camshafts where they line up in the keyway for the gear just as yet another quick check to make sure it's timed properly. You'll notice though that the marks on the chain do not line up with the marks on the teeth. That's okay, it'll take like 160 some odd revolutions before that stuff will all line up again. So we don't care so much about those, we only care about the marks that the factory provided us and the ones that we made in addition to that that do not line the chain up to the gear in a certain position. But if we were to have to pull this chain back off, then we could reset all those marks. It would go on very easily whether we had our cams locked or not. All right, guys, so there you have it. One fully timed and timed correctly VR6 engine. I hope you enjoy this. I hope that this will help you not only time a VR6, but I hope some of the things you learned in this video will help you time any engine. This strategy does apply to pretty much everything out there timing wise. If you have questions, comments, you know what to do. Hey, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up on YouTube. I always appreciate that. Don't forget to subscribe right here on YouTube and ding the notification bell or over on the blog at humblemechanic.com. If you want exclusive content, videos, discounts, you can't get anywhere else to places like Eastwood, Sonic Tools, Black Forest Industries, MT Knives, Eurowise, Kerma TDI, my canic and more check out the crew membership program also if you got some value out of this video you can check out and throw some support over on patreon as well as using my amazon link that one doesn't cost you anything but it does help support the show as well don't forget follow me on facebook twitter instagram and of course snapchat all right guys hey thanks so much for watching i love you and i'll see you next time